So today we're going to discuss cultivating skillful emotions, the cultivation of loving kindness, the first of the Brahma Viharas, coming right up. So I'm Doug Smith. I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association. That's secularbuddhism.org. If you're new to the channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a less stress-filled life, consider subscribing. So when we come to the practice of cultivating skillful emotions, we really often begin with, with what's called metta in Pali, or loving-kindness practice, which is a practice that sort of is an umbrella over all of these skillful emotions. It's the, it's the skillful emotion that really comes through the most, that's the most uh, powerful and meaningful and, and broad, I think, among all of the practices. And cultivation of, of loving-kindness and all of the Brahma-viharas uh, began before the Buddha's lifetime, which is a matter that I discussed in an earlier video where I discussed all of the Brahma-viharas. Uh, but we're going to turn to the first of them, which is loving-kindness. And we're, what we're going to look at is three different ways we can practice uh, loving-kindness meditation. Uh, one from the early tradition, one from a later tradition, and another sort of uh, modified version that seems to be some, uh, I believe, a little bit more recent even than the second. And then we'll look at some, some uh, sort of issues al along with this practice that, that may come up for some of us. So the early practice of, of the Brahma Vihara, or the particular Brahma Vihara of loving kindness, uh, is one uh, that begins after we overcome the five hindrances, what are called the five hindrances. And I did a video on that a, a while back. The five hindrances basically are um, the hindrance of ill will, that is to have, to have ill will in our minds, the, the hindrance of, of greed or of certain kinds of passion of wanting, uh, the, Ill, the, the hindrance of, of sleep. We can be very sleepy and tired, and that can get in the, the way of our meditation. The hindrance also of of sort of a monkey mind, of where our mind is, is worried and concerned and flitting from one thing to another, which can also disrupt meditation. And the fifth one is doubt. And so those are the five hindrances that we're trying to overcome. And once we've overcome them, then we can start uh, doing proper uh, loving-kindness meditation. And we'll get back to the hindrances in a while because they're actually a, a pointer towards a different kind of, of issue. Uh, but in any event, so there are a number of uh, very similar kinds of presentations of how we practice loving kindness in the early tradition, but perhaps one of the more famous, uh, well-known, and sort of repeated over and over again is this one here that I'll read, where the Buddha says, Come, monastics, give up these five hindrances, corruptions of the heart, the weak in wisdom, and meditate, spreading a heart full of loving kindness to one direction, and to the second, and to the third, and to the fourth. In the same way, above, below, across, everywhere, all around, spread a heart full of loving kindness to the whole world, abundant, expansive, limitless, free of enmity and ill will. And here we see what is uh, the sort of classic early practice of loving kindness meditation, where we simply try to generate uh, this, this emotion within us and then think of ourselves as broadcasting the emotion out to the world in various directions. I assume that these are directions one after the other because it's difficult for us to sort of, uh, certainly when we're beginning to sort of think of ourselves as literally spreading this everywhere, it's easier for us to sort of think of spreading it in certain directions because our mind sort of can't get around all at once, sort of, so it's easier to sort of project it. In another sutta that the, the Buddha discusses, projecting this like a conch blower or a horn blower would blow a horn in a particular direction. So that's what we do. We, we sit in meditation. We uh, think of ourselves as extending these things, these, these emotions out of this particular emotion out limitlessly, without limit, without any kind of barrier, so that we're not limiting ourselves to any particular part of the world or any particular sort of being or any particular sort of person, uh, just limitlessly in all directions, so that we think of ourselves as sort of being kind to the whole world, kind to all uh, that is in our experience. Now there's also another similar kind of uh, uh, meditation practice that we find in the early texts, 
which is in the very famous what's called the Metta Sutta in the Sutta Nipata, which is uh, a group of relatively early texts. The Metta Sutta itself, it's not clear that it actually stems from the Buddha's time period or a time period soon after he passed. Uh, I guess that doesn't really matter for our purposes. But in any event, the, the practice we find in the Metta Sutta is a, is a little bit different. It's a little bit, uh, we might say, closer to uh, later uh, or at least heralding later kinds of practices that we're going to find. And so I'll read a couple of, I'm not going to read the whole thing, it's not that long and it's certainly worth a read if you haven't looked at it, but I'll read a couple of, of sort of a key middle paragraphs from the Metta Sutta. Here we read, uh, Just as a mother would protect her son, her only son, with her own life, so one should develop toward all beings a state of mind without boundaries. And toward the whole world one should develop loving kindness, a state of mind without boundaries, above, below, and across, unconfined, without enmity, without adversaries. Now here we see uh, a couple of, or I should say a similarity and a difference. Uh, the similarity is that we're extending this outward un in an unbounded way, that we're not having uh, enmity towards any, that we're not having enemies. And that is, of course, the, the aim of, of metta practice, of loving-kindness practice, is to change the way we think about the world so that we no longer think of the world in terms of, of friends and enemies, or certainly in terms of enemies, uh, rather thinking of the entire world in a friendly way so that we no longer have enemies uh, in our own mind anyhow, that we no longer think of anybody as an enemy, we no longer uh, view them that way in our minds. Uh, we may view them neutrally, we'll, we'll get to that, but we certainly don't view them as enemies. But there's a difference also. And the difference is that here we have the very, very powerful kind of simile that we're to think of uh, the world the way a mother would her, her only son, her only child. So we're to take that as an as if, that we're sort of thinking of the world the way that a mother would a child. And that, of course, lends a great deal of power to the meditation, it, 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 but it also guides the meditation in a certain way because... If we, look, if we think of the, the paragraph, the first paragraph that I read, we don't think of it necessarily in terms of uh, parent and child or mother and child. We just think of it in terms of friendliness. Here, with the Metta Sutta, we are narrowing the focus and, and as it were, deepening it or, or making it more, uh, more profound in a certain kind of, of, of deep emotional sense. So, but we're also restricting it in a way uh, towards a certain kind of relationship, a relationship between mother and child, which, again, uh, may be helpful for, for some of us. It may be helpful for some of us to sort of get the, the attitude off the ground, as it were, figuring out how to actually begin the practice. What are we supposed to be doing? Who are we supposed to be putting ourselves in the mind of? Uh, but it also uh, restricts it in a certain way. And this uh, restriction or personalization of the practice towards certain kinds of individuals and certain kinds of people, we're going to see uh, also deepened and extended in in the middle period, uh, which we'll turn to next, the second kind of practice. And that's the practice we find in in the Vasudhi Magga, which is a, a great a compilation book uh, in the, written, composed sometime in the fifth century of the Common Era, that is to say a thousand years after the Buddha uh, passed away, roughly speaking, by Buddha Gosa. And it's material that was uh, compiled from commentaries that have gone back centuries. So it doesn't all stem from him or his era, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's much later than the original texts. Uh, Buddha Gosa uh, thinks of uh, metta practice, indeed all of the Brahma Vihara practices, as practices that lead us in the direction of what's called jhana. And jhana is sort of the aim of concentration practice. If we can think of the eighth uh, step in the Eightfold Path, the last one of these uh, steps or parts of the eight Eightfold Path is right concentration. Right concentration is our ability to sort of uh, calm our minds and concentrate our minds. And of course it's necessary for any kind of uh, decent meditation to be able to at least concentrate ourselves to an extent where we're no longer, you know, uh, lost in, in the mind sort of flitting around in the way the monkey mind does. But uh, this kind of, of, of concentration is much deeper. It's, it's a concentration where we become absorbed into the, the object of our meditation. 
where the external world uh, to an extent drops away, we no longer really paying attention to the external world, where we are just focused on this one object of meditation. And it's said in the early texts that in order to get there, you have to overcome the, fi the five hindrances that I discussed earlier. And so uh, much of the discussion of the five hindrances in early Buddhism is as a way to get more focused meditation, get more towards uh, John, what's called jhanic meditation. Uh, now, it's worth, also, it's worth emphasizing in the case of jhana that it takes a very, very long time to get there. So it's not something that I think we should necessarily focus on unless we have a lot of time, several hours a day, maybe long periods of, of retreat to do that. For most of us, uh, we're not going to be paying attention to jhana. We'll just be uh, doing these kinds of practices uh, in a normal sort of uh, regular meditative sense, but not in absorption. But I wanted to at least get that across because that is in, in indeed important for the way that um, Buddhaghosa uh, discusses the Brahma Viharas. But in any event, uh, Buddhaghosa starts with the self. Uh, he begins with the meditation on the self. He says we, we should start by basically repeating to ourselves something along the lines of uh, may I be happy and free from suffering. And that is the sort of mantra that we would say if we were doing uh, loving-kindness practice uh, along Buddhaghosa's lines. We would start with that kind of mantra. May I be happy and free from suffering. Or something similar, whatever works for you. Now, uh, Buddhaghosa feels that he has to justify this because in the early texts, uh, the Buddha never discusses uh, loving-kindness uh, towards oneself or indeed any of the Brahma Viharas as, as attitudes towards oneself. Many people may think that the reason that is is because he doesn't want to uh, sort of make us start thinking about ourselves, reifying ourselves, because of course the general practice in early Buddhism was a practice of non-self. And so you might say if we're uh, uh, focusing so much effort uh, internally, uh, meditative effort on ourselves, we might be practicing across purposes. Um, so, but Buddhaghosa realizes that this might be a problem, and so he, he tries to justify it uh, by using uh, an early sutta called the Malika Sutta, uh, which I've discussed in various videos, where uh, basically Queen Malika is asked by the king uh, who she considers most dear to herself. And presumably the king thought that she was going to say, I, I believe the king is most dear to myself. Um, but she doesn't. She says, no, I am most dear to myself. And when the Buddha hears this, the Buddha sort of, it seems like he sort of chuckles and says, you know, yes, it's true that all of us are most dear to ourselves. And as a result, we should not harm one another because each of us is most dear to ourself and none of us want to be harmed. And so that kind of, uh, that kind of understanding by the Buddha, Buddhaghosa takes, a, you know, a millennium later and says, look, the Buddha is saying that we are most dear to ourselves. So if we want to start loving-kindness practice, it's easiest to start with something that's the most dear to us. That way we won't have any trouble. We won't have any trouble uh, generating loving-kindness. So, he, you know, basically says start with yourself. It'll be very easy in that case for you to generate this, this proper emotion, and then we'll work it, you know, in more difficult situations. Uh, now, nowadays we may disagree with this because many, uh, I'm not the first to say that many people, at least in the modern world, in the Western world, have issues with uh, disliking themselves, hating themselves. Uh, and in that case, you might not want to start with yourself because that's going to be difficult. Uh, you might want to put yourself somewhere down this upcoming list that Buddha goes to discusses. So in any event, Buddha, sa Buddha goes to says, start with yourself. Secondly, Buddhaghosa says that we should turn, actually before I say that, I should say that uh, Analio, the great uh, scholar of, of early Buddhism, uh, has also said that, that uh, basically until this time, until the, you know, the 5th century, the uh, Buddhaghosa's Vasudhimagga, uh, no other uh, Buddhist tradition had ever directed loving-kindness towards the self. So this is kind of, this beginning of the loving-kindness practice is really uh, something uh, something that hadn't, hadn't occurred before. So it is actually quite, quite original, to at least to Buddhaghosa's presentation. But in any event, the second... Uh, so once we've done that, once we've, once we've completed uh, loving-kindness towards ourself, presumably we're understanding, you know, we have this uh, deep feeling of loving-kindness, then we extend it towards 
somebody who is dear to us, who has, has been like a benefactor, somebody who, to, towards whom we have a great deal of respect and even reverence. Uh, he, you know, considers like a teacher. We might consider, uh, obviously, for somebody in the very early tradition, we would say the Buddha would be that person. But I think he really means somebody that you actually know, somebody that, you know, may have taught you in school or maybe a meditation teacher or uh, whoever it might be, somebody that you think has done you a great deal of good in your life. Uh, it doesn't have to be a teacher, of course. It could be somebody in your family, somebody, um, somebody. I think in a in a in a state in a state of somewhere ahead of you who has helped you in some way. And again, that's an easy way to extend loving kindness because you have, one would hope, a great deal of kindness towards such a person. Then after the second person, then we go to the third person who is going to be a dear, very dearly loved friend, a very close friend of yours, somebody that you have a great deal of of, of affection for. Uh, and this is not supposed to be somebody. Uh, a, a romantic partner or a sexual partner, that's not really the appropriate, uh, the appropriate uh, mental state here. And we'll get to the reasons why, or at least some of the thinking behind that. But in any event, not a romantic partner, but some, some close friend, some uh, buddy of yours that you, that you have a great affection for. That would be the third. And you're retaining throughout all of these first three this, this, this uh, emotional state of loving kindness. Now the fourth for Buddhaghosa is going to be the neutral person. The neutral person is somebody that you perhaps don't even know their name. You see them on the street, you see them in a shop, you see them at the gym, wherever it happens to be, you don't, somebody that you don't know personally really, except that you've seen them. And what you try to do is to extend the same attitude, the same emotional attitude of friendliness and kindness towards this, uh, towards this neutral person that you have towards the prior three. So you try to retain the same kind of sense of real kindness and friendliness. And then the fifth, uh, once we've gotten through all these first four, the fifth is, is going to be uh, the enemy or the person that you have antagonism for. For many of us, the, the, the person towards whom we're antagonistic is going to be the most difficult. Of course, that's always the case in this kind of practice. Buddha Gosa doesn't say we're supposed to think of them kindly as a friend, the way we did the first bunch, but rather to think of them as neutral. So to try to think of them without uh, any ill will, without any rancor, without any kind of anger or hatred, just to think of them as a neutral person. And I think that is supposed to be a stepping stone along the way towards eventually thinking of them as a friend. Because if we can get, if we can practice this long enough and get it deep enough such that we no longer think of them as an enemy, then we've moved them to, uh, we've moved them to a different category. And once we no longer think of them as an enemy, we now think of them as a neutral person and now we can begin once again to practice with them as a neutral person. In other words, thinking of them in, in a friendly way. And in this way, we sort of break, as, as Buddhaghosa puts it, we sort of break down the barriers so that we eventually think of the entire world in terms of friendliness. And indeed, if we're going to uh, really practice deep jhana in each of these cases, and here's where jhana sort of comes in, uh, we have to have completely eradicated all the hindrances, uh, the five hindrances that I discussed earlier. One of those hindrances is ill will. If we have ill will towards somebody, uh, a, a, you know, an enemy, a, you know, somebody who's done us ill, somebody who's done us some kind of hurt, if we have ill will towards that person, we're not going to be able to actually get into the proper uh, deep meditative state with regard to them because we're going to have that ill will with us. So in fact, in order to practice this kind of practice in the deep way that Buddhaghosa feels we should, we're actually going to have to give up the ill will towards that person. We're going to have to at least think of them as neutral and then hopefully think of them as friendly. And Buddhaghosa says also that we should try as... In each of these stages, we should try to make, he says, make the mind malleable and wieldy with regard to that state, with regard to that particular person, before moving on to the next. The phrase malleable and wieldy uh, usually comes up in the context of, again, of jhanic meditation. It means that it's easy to get into jhana and out of jhana, that the, the mind works fluidly, that we're not having to push anything. In other words, that we're sort of well practiced with it. You know, we're not having to it's, it's, not, it's not something that we really have to make effort towards, but the mind just sort of does automatically. 
But even if we're not, again, if, even if we're not doing jhana, we can still take that and as useful in the sense that these are supposed to be deep, uh, relatively long practices, regular practices. And so we should think of them as, you know, not sort of going from one to the other quickly the way, in fact, I usually tend to practice these, which I shouldn't, um, but rather focusing on each of them for, for extended periods of time, one after the other, uh, maybe one one day, one another day, whatever it happens to be, whatever works for you, so that the practice comes to you easily in each of the cases. And as we move down that list, of course, it may be more difficult. And that's the point, is that we're going to, you know, we're going to work harder at it as we, uh, certainly as we start, and as we work down that list. Now, I said earlier that um, Bodhigosa tells us not to, not to do this practice with regard to somebody uh, towards whom we're romantically inclined or have a sexual relationship with. Um, and here I think it may be useful to us in the West, anyhow, and some of you may have some familiarity with ancient Greek philosophy, there were three different kinds of love in ancient Greece, at least three different words that we, all trans we can all translate with the word love in English. Uh, one was agape, one was philia, and one was eros. Uh, agape is sort of a universal love. It's the love which in uh, the Christian church eventually becomes uh, that which we talk about in respect of God. That is, God's love is sort of universal. It's, it's something that doesn't have boundaries. Uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, philia, philia, on the other hand, is brotherly love. It's the love that we have towards family, towards close friends. It's, it's love of people who are in our sort of group, in our, you know, in our sort of, uh, in our group of people that we know closely. And we love them because they are our friends, they're close to us, they're people that we know well. And last is eros, which of course we probably know is going to be uh, sexual and romantic love. It, once we see this distinction in ancient Greece, we can see that it, it really makes the same the, the same distinction can be pushed over into into sort of the Buddhist practice of loving kindness, where um, in early tradition we really are talking about agape, the kind of universal love towards all uh, without boundaries, uh, where we aren't even talking about individual people at all in the early tradition. We're just simply talking about extending this kind of emotion out in all the directions. Uh, that begins to change a little bit with the Metta Sutta, where we suddenly have this uh, metaphor or simile of the mother and child. That gets us a little closer to, to philia, to brotherly love, to the love of family, to the love of people close to us, uh, which can be somewhat more clinging than the universal love. And when we get to Buddhaghosa, what we're going to find is that Buddhaghosa tends to, uh, much of his practice really is, again, related to philia, to related to uh, brotherly love, to related to the love that we have of people close to us, to patrons or, or uh, teachers or benefactors, that kind of uh, love, uh, appreciation of people close to us who have helped us in various ways, but that Buddhaghosa is always trying to sort of push us, break, as he says, breaking down the barriers, pushing us towards agape pushing us towards universal love. So it wasn't that, that uh, Buddhaghosa had a different idea, it was rather that he had a practice to get us from uh, what we might say is philia, or brotherly love, towards universal love in a, in a series of stages. And indeed, in an earlier video of mine, I talked about an early text in a different uh, tradition, a non the I should say Buddhaghosa is in the Theravada tradition, this other text, uh, early text, similar kind of time period in a different tradition called the Abhidharma Koshabashya, where we also have a discussion of a similar kind of practice where we go from one person to a different person. You know, we go from a friend, a close friend to a, a distant friend to a neutral person to an enemy. And in that text, that kind of practice, the, basically the kind of practice that Buddhaghosa is talking about, is discussed as a kind of a practice for beginners. It's discussed as, uh, it said, a practice for people who, who have a sort of a mental defilement and as a result can't do the sort of basic practice we find in the early text. The early text just being able to extend loving kindness out to the world. Uh, the claim in, in the Abhidharma Koshabashya is uh, many of us have mental defilements of certain kinds where we just aren't able to do that. We sort of can't generate the right emotional tone within ourselves. We just can't sort of find it. And so we need all kinds of pointers towards getting there, basically towards, you know, philia, towards brotherly love, which is much easier to get towards than universal love. 
uh, insofar as we have that kind of barrier, that kind of, in their words, defilement, I believe it's Vasubandhu who wrote the text of, in his words, uh, in any event, we would, we would use that kind of step-by-step -step mode if we can't do the, the earlier one. So I've given two general practices, one from the early texts, which is universal, one from the later texts, which is going from sort of brotherly love to universal love. There's also a third practice, which I'm not exactly sure where this one begins, but we do find it nowadays. Uh, I've, I've had it talked to me, I mean, given to me in many lectures over, you know, meditation lectures over the years, which is somewhere in between, where what we do is we extend, we have a mantra where we say, uh, may all, let's say, may all beings be happy. Uh, may, um, may all beings in this room be happy. May all beings in this country be happy. May all beings in the world be happy. This kind of thing, where we're extending universally, but only towards certain categories, and we're extending these categories out until we say, may all beings everywhere be happy, because that's, you know, supposedly, or presumably that's going to be the biggest category that inc includes everything. Um, but this practice is slightly different from either two, because first of all, we're working with a mantra, so it's not like the first practice. The first practice had no words involved. It was simply an extension of, of a kind of emotional state. Uh, and it's slightly different from the second because we're not dealing with individual people like Buddhaghosa was. He's not, we're not here not dealing with a benefactor or a set of myself and a benefactor and a friend. Here we're dealing with all people in a certain category. And this is a third way that we can practice. I think certainly if we're beginning on this practice, what we should do is to find whichever one of these three practices works for us. If we uh, need a mantra, need something to say to ourselves while we're meditating, which uh, I mean I personally do find useful, helpful, um, then use one of these different mantras, either Buddhaghosa's way of particular people in your life, or this other way that uh, I found, you know, is repeated many places of the all, you know, all people, all beings, uh, may everybody be happy, that kind of thing, which also is a, a very sort of uh, pushing us towards a universal kind of, of approach to this kind of of, of attitude. And we may ask what the point of loving-kindness meditation is, and there are many, many points to it. It's a very deep practice, but probably the one of the more famous points to it, one of the more famous reasons why we do this practice is as an antidote to certain kinds of unskillful mental states, in particular, or I should say em emotional states, and in particular emotional states of ill will, hatred, and anger. And it should, be, it should not be used as an escape from those. That would not be a skillful way to use loving-kindness meditation because it's not going to work very well that way and it's going to tend to cover over rather than really dealing with anger. But on the other hand, if, we deal, if we've dealt with the anger already, and I had a video a while back on dealing with anger, but if we've dealt with the anger already or if we're in a situation where we need for whatever reason, uh, to get out of it for a time, and we understand that, then the, the practice of metta or loving-kindness meditation is one of the central practices of, of basically shifting the focus of the mind from something that's unskillful, that is anger, hatred, towards something that's skillful, that is a kindness and, 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 love, and love towards all beings. So that is the general, we have three practices here, we have a reason for doing them, I hope that you'll make it a regular part of, of your practice, uh, either every day or every week, because I think you'll find that the more that you practice, the, the easier it becomes and the more that it makes a difference in your life. So thanks all of you. Thanks so much to, to my patrons over on Patreon for helping support the work that we, that we see here every day, every week. Um, thanks so much to all of the subscribers of the channel. I hope that you feel you're getting something out of it. I'm I assume you do, You've, you're subscribing, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you. And I hope we'll catch you on, on the next one of these videos. So, so meanwhile, all of you, uh, be well, be happy, uh, be healthy, be full of loving kindness.